Praise God. I'm excited. Anybody excited to be in the house? Well, lo- last week we, we, we started talking about the spirit of grace. Because, uh, you know, without the spirit of grace, without Jesus, we sing the songs. He is the spirit of grace. It's his uh, Pentecost. We, we just come out of Pentecost, and I, I mentioned this last week. If you weren't here, I would encourage you, if you're watching this, go back to last week and watch part one. Amen? Can I ask you? Because I, I'm building upon something. But, but Pentecost, everybody's focused on this power that falls out from heaven and charges people up like energizer bunnies to be bouncing around like crazy people, laying hands on everybody, throwing out things. And yes, that is true. But if you actually understand the fullness of Pentecost, God poured himself out of everything he is, he poured out. And part of that is the spirit of grace he poured out on Pentecost for every believer. The spirit of prophecy he poured out. He poured out everything. He didn't just pour out signs, wonders, and miracles. He poured out everything who he is. He poured out in his spirit on that day. And so so I'm going to be sharing some stuff. What do we do with that? But last week, we, we started looking at, at the law versus the spirit, legalism, law, rules, regulations, all those things. You must attend church without the spirit of grace, and it's just legalism. You must do your devotion and confessions every day. That's legalism. But the, the letter of the law kills, destroys, puts people in bondage, but the spirit of grace brings life. So when I invite the Spirit of God in my life because I attend church and He's in it, all of a sudden I move from legalism to joy and being part of a community and being a blessing to that community. Amen? All of a sudden when I do my declarations, it's not under legalism because if I forget one out, I'm cursed. Or if I forget to do it for a day or two, come on. As your pastor, and I know there's many pastors, there's sometimes a day or two goes by and you haven't spent as much time as you wanted to because you, you're busy with things in life. Don't look at me with that religious look. But you know what? When you put word in you, you have word in you and you're meditating all the time on word, right? But don't stay out of it long because you'll dry up. But the spirit of grace comes upon you and says, okay, son, walk, 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 daughter, walk. It's okay. You didn't do your devotion today. You didn't do your confession today. It's okay. Just keep going. I'm with you. But don't stay out of it long. You with me? Amen. And we looked at some of these things. And we looked at grace. The, the word grace is from the word charis or charis. It's really talking about God's divine influence on our hearts. The Holy Spirit influencing our hearts toward the Word, toward Jesus, toward salvation, toward the the promises of God. That's grace. That's grace at work. So you cannot have a life with Jesus without the Spirit of grace operating in your life. It's impossible. You're going to dry out. You're going to be jumping over hoops. You're going to look like you're in a circus. We need the Spirit of grace. I need the Spirit of grace. When I prepare, I'm like, God, I need the spirit of grace to help me deliver what you want this morning. I pray for the grace of God on our worship team, on our media, on everything. Lord, we need your grace to help with this church right now. Amen? We need the spirit of grace. It also talks about unmerited favor. Grace is unmerited favor. You You don't get favor from a man. You get it from Jesus Christ. He, you, you get it from the source who is the spirit of grace himself. He's the one that pours out unmerited favor to all men. Amen. So if you want favor, touch the hem of Jesus and draw on the grace that's provided. And that's in the place you get favor. You're with me, church. And we looked at that grace has always been prophesied. It was prophesied. It was God's heart from the beginning that I'll pour out the spirit of grace upon the house of David. Guess what? You're the New Testament church. You are the New Testament house of David. Amen. And so it was something predestined. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a last minute thing. The spirit of grace was prophesied and predestined that you in this time and season would have the spirit of grace poured out upon you when you said, Jesus, come into my life. Amen. And we also looked at that grace comes through Jesus. Amen. We save by faith or we save by grace through faith. Amen? So, so it, 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 grace was there, but it was by faith that took the grace that we need to walk in. Amen? So it's never, ever 
a lack of favor or a lack of grace issue. It's a lack of faith issue. Uh, people say, I need more favor. No, you need faith. You need to build your faith because you have favor. Grace was poured out. If you're not walking in it, it's your fault. It's really your faith issue is the issue. And we're going to look at a few things this morning. Can we go, can we launch off where we were last week? Amen. Praise God. Who's excited? Who's ready? Come on, I'm ready. I just, I just find it so hard sometimes how, how believers can sit in church year after year after year after year after year and, and sit with, with issues in their lives. And I'm, I'm not downplaying anything. But sit with cycles and issues in their lives and not get past it, not move past it. When Jesus, He wants you to progress from faith to faith, line upon line, precept upon precept. There's always growth and momentum in God. The moment our life doesn't have momentum and growth, there's something wrong with us. We're the block. He's given all access and we have access to everything we need in Him. Amen? And every promise you need, every situation. Listen, when you, I know men, us men, okay, I'll be humble right now. We have an issue. When we open up something new, have you ever, I don't know why people buy stuff from Ikea. Like who wants to spend three hours putting a piece of furniture together? We, we got a toy box the other day for, for, for Ezekiel. And my wife said, I've ordered this toy box. I said, awesome. And this box rocks up. I'm like, it's not going to fit in there. No, you have to assemble it. I'm like, why do you want to buy something that I have to assemble? Can't you just buy furniture nowadays that's already assembled? Please, somebody. Can you come up with a cost-effective solution? You'll, you'll make millions and billions, I promise you. Like, like, is it people that just don't have anything to do with their time that want to put furniture together? Am I right? And then my wife says, are those meant to be left over? I said, I said it's spares. They always put spares in. <laughs> right? I mean, it must be, they never did maths. Whoever was packing couldn't count properly. Like, why is there extra screw? Why is there extra dowel? Who puts that in there extra? Amen? I mean, just do this with it. It's sturdy. Let the boy walk on it. It's fine. That's the spare. It's not missing. <laughs> but, but, but it's got a manual that comes with it. We've got a manual on how to operate our life, how to put it together, but we don't go to it enough. Just because the Spirit of Grace is there, we're going to look at a few things this morning. But we need to go to the manual because, hey, you want a good marriage? Go to the manual. You want a successful business? Go to the manual. You want finances? You know, we talk about things. The reason we do tithes and offering is not to beg for offerings. It's to get people out of struggle mode into, into kingdom principle mode where blessing flows. And so people just don't, don't, don't grow and develop their faith in areas and they stay stuck. But the word, I know of people this week that have breakthroughs in the financial area, but they're people that have been diligent and all of a sudden, boom, 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 breakthrough. I had somebody sitting here that came to visit a mate of mine and he said, uh, he, we're talking, he said, I, I, had, I just want to share a testimony. He says, I didn't tell you, but when I was there, I just put whatever was in my pocket in, in the offering bucket when it came, and I named it because there was a, a, a vehicle I needed sold, and it hadn't sold. And the very week, it broke through, it sold. Uh, something came through in, in, in the business that they needed, and they found a credit in something else that was there. Breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough by applying principles in their life and living by those principles. Amen? We have the manual and everything we need is in there. Amen? So I want to talk about growing in grace first. Number one. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 16. Come on, who's ready to receive? Who's going to grow in grace this morning? It says there, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught... And unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. Now hold on. The apostle saying, these are untrained people who are pros at preaching. Untrained and unstable and they twist Scripture to suit themselves. 
and they deceive many. Right? That's what the apostle says. That, that's why, let me just say this. I don't like using the word, word of faith too much, even though I understand what it means, but I have faith in the word. I don't want to create a denominational thing here, right? But that's why when you come to this church, you hear the word preached. Not, 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 not how I feel, not what things go. If the Spirit of God moves and prophecy flows, great. But it, if it doesn't line up with the Scripture, it will be corrected. So don't be embarrassed. If it gets corrected, it's because that, that whatever came out was not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God always undergirds the Word of God. Amen? You can't go wrong. Amen? But look here. He says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with error of the wicked. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does he say grow in, in the world's opinions? Does he say grow in, in, in a, a doctor's opinion? No. Does he say grow in religion, denominational opinion? No. He says, what did he say? In the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Amen. See, sometimes, sometimes Jesus is not preached. And you go, it doesn't mean you have to talk about Jesus all the time. It means talk about the word all the time. Amen? Didn't uh, John 1 say that he was the word and in the beginning he was the word and the word became flesh and he dwelt with us? In other words, the word and Jesus cannot be separated. So if you tell me you love Jesus, that means you love obeying the word. You can't tell me you love Jesus if you disobey the word of God in every area. Amen? And we won't go there yet. I'm trying to be nice. Amen? Just tell your neighbor, he, he loves us, he loves us, he loves us. He said, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, listening to unstable, untaught individuals. In other words, when you take your eyes off Jesus, when you take your eyes off the word of God, you open yourself up to error. Amen? When I listen to stuff, when I listen to prophecies, when I look at prophecies, apparently today God's got something new to say every single day. Every single minute, every single hour. It's amazing. Jeremiah only prophesied like four times his whole life. Okay? So you've got to separate what is a thus says the Lord to an exhortation and encouragement. There's a big difference between the two. We can exhort all the time. But when I say thus is the Lord and today he's saying this and then by lunchtime he's saying something else. We need to check. Is that exhortation or is that a thus is the Lord Kairos moment of visitation that God's about to show up and do something? Thank God we don't stone people anymore. Amen? Get locked up. Amen? <laughs> but you see, what happens is the moment, if we don't have the Word of God in our hearts and in our lives as our foundation, it is so easy for the enemy to open you up to deception. So easy. And you know the beautiful thing about church community? This, this is it. There's accountability. You have people encouraging you. you. You see people's motives and intent. The moment you start challenging something and you're going, what you're doing is out of line. No, it's not. The Spirit of God told me. Well, he can't tell you that because he can't go against the Word of God. So your flesh is telling you that. And your ego. And your pride. And all the other things is actually telling you that. And a deceptive spirit that's actually latched onto you, that has caused you not to even know the voice of God anymore. So anything that whispers in your ear, you think it's Holy Spirit, but it's a holy setup for a holy hiding. Because I've taken my eyes off the Word of God. Amen? Come, on, I'm preaching grace here this morning, but we've got to go on a journey. Amen? That's why I would say, if I see a spirit of Jezebel manifesting, I promise you I'm going to take it on with love. But if it doesn't repent, then I'm going to bring God into it with the Holy Ghost hiding. And then if it doesn't want to, I'm going to help it and flesh escort it out the church and move on to protect the sheep. And I do it unapologetically. But it's always done from a platform of love and opportunity to acknowledge, identify, repent and move to restoration. But if it doesn't want it, 
somewhere else that will take you that can't see you. Amen? But we have to. We have to keep our eyes fixed on the Word. He says, yeah, but grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Amen? You know, he's talking about grow up or increase. So we, we can, we, we look at scriptures and it tells us that we can be babes on, on milk. We can be like children, you know. He says, be like a child to enter the kingdom, but he doesn't say be childish. Childish, you know, like kids, like, you know, kids want to argue all the time. Right? Have you ever, have you ever had a two-year-old dictate to you about not wanting to eat food because it wants an iPad? No. Like that, that's, it hasn't matured yet to go, okay, I can have that later. Let me do this. And sometimes we get like that. We, we, we argue with God. We argue with people. We argue when, when correction comes. But he says that we to grow up and increase in the grace and knowledge of God. Amen. So he's saying grow up and increase in the, in the positioning yourself to be influenced by the divine influence. Amen. So I need to mature enough to know when God's telling me to do something. I had a great opportunity to open up and, and doors open up. And I, was, I, was, I said, yes, I'll commit to it. And it was on a national, uh, international thing. And, and I felt the Lord saying, after I'd done that, go back and tell them that you can't be a part of it. Because you don't, you don't have the capacity right now. So what? The maturity I had to put an ego in the pocket to go, hey, guys, sorry, I, I can't do it. Because his voice is more important to me. Amen? And I had to just go, I can't do it right now. So you got that divine influence. Am I growing and in, in increasing in maturity to be led by the Holy Spirit? Amen? Am I, am I growing and increasing in the knowledge of Jesus? See, to, to increase in grace means I need to increase in the knowledge of the Word. Amen? Are you with me? I need to increase in the word. Where you focus on, if you focus your energy on, on getting to know the word, amen, you're going to have the fruits of the word in your life. You know that Jesus is in every single book of the Bible. Every single book. He didn't just show up in, in the gospel. He, he's in every single book. I'll show you. In Genesis, Jesus Christ is the breath of life. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar by cloud and the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's the judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he's the trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's the reigning king. In Ezra, and Nehemiah he's the rebuilder of broken down walls and lives come on somebody in Esther he is our Mordecai in Job he is our living redeemer in Psalms he is our shepherd in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes he is our wisdom in Song of Solomon he's the loving bridegroom in Isaiah he's the prince of peace in Jeremiah he is our righteous branch in Lamentations he's the weeping prophet in Ezekiel he's the four-faced man in Daniel he's the fiery furnace come on somebody needs to get in fiery furnace Hosea He's the faithful husband. Come on, if you don't have a husband, he's the faithful husband. Uh, uh, Joel, he's the baptizer. Amos, he's the burden bearer. Uh, Beniah, he's the mighty to save. In Jonah, he's the foreign missionary. In Micah, he's the beautiful feet. In uh, Na Nahum, he's the strength and shield. In Habakkuk, he's the evangelist crying out. In Zephaniah, he's our savior. In Haggai, he's our restorer. In Zechariah, he's the fountain opened up. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness. I'm not finished. That's Old Testament. Let me get to New Testament for a moment. In Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's our servant. In Luke, he's the son of man, feeling what you feel. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the savior of the world. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In Corinthians, he's the father of Israel. In Corinthians, he's the triumphant one, giving victory. In Galatians, he's your liberty who sets you free. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the church. Not a denomination. He's the head of the church. Amen. Philippians, he is your joy. Colossians, he is your completeness. Uh, Thessalonians, he is your hope. Uh, Timothy, he is your faith and stability. Titus, he is your truth. Philemon, he is your benefactor. Hebrews, he is your perfection. James is the power behind your faith. 
Peter, he's your example. Peter, he's your purity. Uh, first John, he's your life. Second John, he's your pattern. Third John, he's your motivation. Jude, he's your foundation of your faith. And Revelation, he's your soon coming Lord and Savior. Amen? So if you want to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus, you get in the Word. Whatever you need, whatever area you need to fill, get into the Scripture and meditate on it. Chew on it. Get after it. That's how grace is going to grow in your life. Amen? I'm not finished. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of all creation. He is the architect of the universe. He was and is and always will be. He is unmoved, unchained, undefeated. He is bruised and brought, with, and brought healing. He is pierced in his pain. He is persecuted but brought freedom. He is dead but brought life. He was dead but brought life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. Leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. People uh, couldn't, un uh, couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. New Age can't replace him, somebody. Science can't explain him. Life, love, and longevity and more. That's who he is. He's the goodness, kindness, and gentleness of God. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. He is right and the word of eternal life. He is unchanging and his mind is on you and me all the time. He is interceding on your behalf. He is my savior, my redeemer, my guide, my peace, my joy, my comfort, my Lord. And he's the Lord of my life. What about you? Amen. If you want to grow in grace and knowledge, you've got to get in the Word of God. That's how you're going to grow in Him. Amen? So if we were saved by grace through faith, how do we grow in this grace? How do we grow in this grace? How do we grow in this unmerited favor? How do we grow in His promises and His benefits? How do we grow in these things? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked me this morning. You know, yesterday I went to go visit Uncle Ed Chapman. Everyone know Eddie and, and Beryl Chapman? And uh, I walked in, he was lying on his bed, and uh, she got him up out the bed, and he came and sat with me. I didn't want to leave there. It felt like I was sitting with my grandparents. He reminded me so much of my grandparents. But you know what? His body looked tired, but man, his spirit, he had word in him. I had to come and prepare at the church. I didn't want to leave there. I felt I was getting washed when I went to go visit him. He keeps telling me, he says, you know, those who keep their minds steadfast on the word shall have peace. He keeps telling me that I, I, he is my healer, my redeemer, the one that set me free. I've had a good life. He's blessed me. And all that came out of him was the word of God. See, when you get around people and you sit with people for a few moments, you can tell how much word and how much intimacy and how much relationship they have by what comes out their mouth. Have you gone in half an hour, hour in a conversation with somebody and you haven't even heard one thing about God, one thing about Scripture, one thing about the Word of God linking to your situation, your circumstance? Or are we just talking about the negative? Are we talking about the problems, the issues? I'm all for having fun and talking sports and motorcycles. I love that. But, but let me ask you this. In the presence of Him, it was just oozing with the Word of God. I, didn't, I, I felt so refreshed. I, 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 I said to Pastor Megs, I felt like I went to a revival. I was like, he could have just laid hands on me and I, like, I probably would have been sleeping there still to, tomorrow morning. But you know what? In his eyes, his soul, when you look in there, you just see Jesus. You just see Jesus. Why? Because he's, he, he's grown and growing on going. Amen. He says, I have questions. But then God speaks to me about my questions because I go to the word and he tells me everything I need to know in the word. The peace that's in that house is amazing. Why? Because Jesus, we sing the song, I speak Jesus. Do you really? Do you speak of him or do you speak him? See, remember, remember, remember those dudes, the sons of Skiva. Those dudes, I forgot their names. But, but they rock up and they want to cast out demons. And the demons look and go, not today. 
It says, you see, Paul, I know Peter, I know that Jesus, I, we, we knew. Like we knew when he came there, we were like, just back off, go back into the shadows. But who are you? You see, I, I, can't, I can't speak Jesus unless I've been with Jesus. You, you see, you can't go out and, and, and evangelize and have God demonstrate with, with, with secondhand revelation or speaking of something you heard somebody else say. But when I tell you about what God did for me, what, I, what he did for my finances, what he came through for this, what he did for my healing, who he is in my life, when I was a broken person and I was led astray and I was depressed, oppressed, and I had no future, but he came into my life, I can tell you about him because I've had an encounter with him. Amen? I can speak of that Jesus. Who are we speaking about? Uncle Ed speaks of Jesus. So how do we grow in this faith? Good question. Can you stop interrupting now? In Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10 verse 14, it says this, How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings and good, good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says this, The Lord who has believed our Lord who has believed our report. So faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. He says, first thing you need to understand there is when he says in verse 14, in whom they have not believed. Believed means to have faith in someone or something. Amen. I love what Pastor Tony always say. He say, faith has a bigger brother called trust. When you say you have faith and you believe, the level of your faith and belief is determined by your trust and peace. Amen. When I say I believe, that means I trust. When I trust, I have peace. If there's no peace in my life, that means I don't trust. If I don't trust, it means I'm short-circuiting my belief. And it says, how can you call upon him, somebody? Come on. How can you call upon him if you have not believed? How can I call upon that divine influence? How can I call upon the promises of God? How can I call upon unmerited favor if I don't believe? You can only call upon what you believe. Amen? Because otherwise all it is is, is, a, is, a, is a desperate get me out of here prayer. Hoping something happens. And it's not birthed from a place of relationship. It's birthed from a place of panic. Amen? Everyone with me? It says, how do you know if you haven't believed? So there's two questions. Number one, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Let me break that up. Savior means I know I'm not going to hell. But Lord means I submit to him no matter what and I submit to the final authority of the word of God. So when it says, hey, give, I give because I submit to scripture. When it says lay hands on the sick, I lay hands on the sick. Come on, how many times somebody tell you about something that, that's wrong in their body and you're like, oh, well, you know, just believing with you. That's an opportunity to lay hands on the sick. Right there. Go, that's an invite. I remember walking through Rabina Town Center one, and, and a very mature gentleman was sitting there. And um, he called me over and he started talking to me like he knows me. And I'm going, okay. And I said, I, I couldn't remember what the name was. I said, but that's not who I am. I'm Sean. He says, you look like the guy I'm waiting for. And he started listing his mind and his body and all these things. And he was holding my hand. We hadn't let go. And I felt the Lord say, this is a direct access line from heaven. What are you going to do with it? And I said, well, while I'm here, how about I pray for that in your body? He said, what do you mean? I said, I'll pray for you. Jesus said, if I lay hands on the sick, we're kind of laying hands right now. I just need to pray if you want, if you believe. And I prayed for him. It was an opportunity to bring heaven to earth, to connect. There's opportunities all around us. 
are we looking? If he says, be obedient to the word, we do it. If he says, forgive those, forgive them. Let me just tell you something about forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to trust somebody again. Forgiveness means I just let go and release you. But I don't necessarily have to trust you. So you move from year to year, but I love you from a distance. But I love you. And if you were ever in trouble and need and you reached out, I'd help you. But you don't need to live in my space. See, people don't know how to do this thing properly. They don't know how to do this thing properly. I mean, the second question, is he your final authority? Is, is he your final authority in, in your health, in your peace, in your finances, in your identity, in your relationships? Amen. Do you believe that? See, in verse 17, so faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. See, people can't come to, in the normal setting, people can't come to know Jesus without two things. Either they've opened the Bible and read it and the Holy Spirit met them there. Or number two, somebody told them about it. Faith come by hearing and hearing. And the same way for us, unless, unless you're hearing the Word of God, unless you're hearing preaching, unless you're hearing about finances, unless you're hearing about health, unless you're uh, uh, hearing about the grace of God over and over, that's not going to develop in your life. And, and then if you're not reading about it, if you're not studying it, if you're not spending time in it, digging your own well, going into it, if there's a deficit in your life and and maybe it's health you're struggling with if you're not going into the scriptures to look that hey he paid the price for my healing i'm made whole because of the blood of jesus he said that i can have divine health and healing by by the finished work of the cross if i'm not going in to dig that well and and press in with it how can i believe it how can i walk in it how can i receive it how can i ask for that now there's moments people reach out and go, I, I need healing and they don't know the Lord and God shows up, He demonstrates His Word. But I know people that have been healed from cancer and they walk out into a, a car park and go light up a cigarette. And that, what you've just done there is you've opened that back up into your life. You, you can't pray for health, divine health. Let me say this, you can't pray for divine health if you're eating hamburgers every single day of your life and fried chips and all this type of stuff. You don't have, a, Satan has a legal right to come in because you're sowing into your flesh. You don't have a, how do I have a legal right when I'm doing the wrong things? It's like, Lord, protect me, but I'm going to go on the oncoming traffic all the way to Brisbane, break the speed limit, but angels will be with me. No, they were in the left-hand lane. You're on your own. That's called presumptuous. And being a nutcracker. Amen. People come back and go, the, the devil got me. I got a speeding fine. No, that's your flesh. Drive the speed limit. Rebuke you, Satan. Pay back seven times. He's like, I wasn't even in the car with you. And no, we, we're running at a deficit. Yeah, you not getting seven times. Don't give them seven times what they're asking for. We had nothing to do with that. Speed on. Rebuke the devil. Come on. Amen. Rebuke yourself. Look in the mirror. Pastoring has an advantage. You hear a lot of stuff and see a lot of stuff. Let me just say that. You see a lot more than you see. I kind of feel like God sometimes. See a whole lot of things like, did I have to see that? Delete, delete, Lord. Please block my ears. I didn't want to hear that. Jesus, help me, Lord. I think there's a cleansing lane for pastors when they get to heaven. They put things in, rinse their ears, wash their eyes, scrub their heads, cleanse them. Go, now you can come back in. All that's left behind. Let the ones that are on earth still have it. Amen. Praise God. You guys keep distracting me. I'm really trying to finish this message. Amen. Remember James 1. Don't worry about putting it up. But he says, of, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. By his, he uses the word to bring us forth. So grace is released through the word of God. Getting to know the spirit of grace is released through the word of God. 
1 Peter 1.23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides in us. Amen. The spirit of grace was deposited in us at Pentecost. But are you spending time to, to draw on that word, to get to know him better? Amen. I shared it last week. If you weren't here last week, the Holy Spirit manifests in so many different ways. He's known as so many different things in the Bible. The Spirit of the Lord, the, the Spirit of the Son of Man, the Spirit of God. There's so many ways. The Spirit of prophecy, the Spirit of truth. He manifests. as how He manifests. He's not a whole lot of separate individuals. He is three in one. And Holy Spirit manifests His attributes and His outworkings in different ways. One of the ways the Spirit of grace manifests is to draw us back to the Word. To draw us into intimacy. And guess what? It means we don't have to be moved on our performance. We, he moves us based on Jesus' performance. Amen. Nothing you and I do. I was stuck so long for many years trying to do the right things and feeling if I wasn't doing my confessions right or I missed a day. And one time I put this ridiculous pressure on myself, believe it or not, that if I didn't spend an hour a day, I was a heathen. Because God had called me to ministry. I had to have an hour a day. Amen. And I like my sleep. And I'm like, Lord, please don't wake me up at 3 o'clock. I don't do intercessory prayer. I don't pray at 3 o'clock in the morning. Please. Like, meet me in my quiet time. And we've got a good relationship. The devil sometimes annoys me. All right? But, and, and the dog sometimes. Okay? Don't feed your dog after 7. They'll wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Like busting. Door. I don't be like call and wake up in the morning, come and clean up. No, no, just go out, be cleansed, come back in, go back to sleep. Amen. But yet, here's my question: Do you do you spend time on Sundays listening to the Word of God and then going home forgetting it? You know how I grew my faith. I used to take the pastor's message every Sunday and break it up through the week and go meditate on it. Meditate on it. Because when you actually understand spiritually that, that you're, in a, you're in a field where God has planted you, right? And if you, if you don't believe you're planted, go find somewhere, get planted. But get planted, rooted. Because it's in the planting and rooting where God calls you that God is the right substance, the right nutrients there for you that you need to feed and draw from. In other words, you don't have to come to church on a Sunday and go listen to every other prophet online or every other evangelist or whatever and feed your stuff for that and come back here and feel confused. I'm not saying anything wrong with filling yourself with other things. But do you take the word and go, man, I want to I want to dig deeper. I want to go into the scriptures for myself. I want to start. This is what Uncle Eddie said to me. He said, you know what I do all my life? He says, people don't know how to do this today in the church. People don't even know how to pray in church. He says, I do because I got the word in me. He says, but one thing I learned is how to cross-reference. How to cross-reference. Because out the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word be established. Amen. And the law of first mention, the first time something's mentioned in the Bible, it carries through. Amen. It doesn't end. And you've got to look at the context that was first mentioned and you understand that through Christ that gets amplified, magnified. Amen. Even more powerful. But, but to be able to take the word back and you go back and spend time in the word and go, I'm going to go back in the word and I'm going to meditate and I'm going to dissect it and I'm going to spend time because I want to grow in the knowledge of God. I want to grow in the spirit of grace. I want to grow in the areas that God wants me. Do I do that? That helped me. Maybe it'll help you. Amen. I, I, I made this little thing. Uh, the, the input of your seeds, of seeds in your life, is in direct proportion to the outward fruits. The, the, the input of seeds of the word of God into your life is in direct proportion to the outward fruits in your life. And, and so if the fruits on the outside are, are looking a bit shady, it's probably because the seeds are not the right seeds that's getting put in. Amen. Amen. And so when I put the right seeds in and meditate on a chew on a day and night, what does Joshua say? God makes your way successful? No. Meditate on my word day and night and you make your way successful. The word of God is power and life and truth. 
And when we meditate on it and get it in us, you guaranteed success because the word is alive and active. Amen. It's a weapon. It's a tool. It produces after its own kind. It produces fruit. Amen. And so this is the thing. You can't walk around grudging, having grudges on people. Amen. And expecting grace on your own life. There's a lot of people walking around critical, judging people, judging this, judging this minister, judging this pastor, judging that person, whatever. But in their own lives, they go, Lord, I need your, I need your forgiveness. And the Lord says, doesn't he say that in the same measure you sow, it shall be measured back? So uh, how's that going to work out? Amen. What are we putting in our lives? You're getting something out of this. If you focus on law, you're going to get law. If you focus on strife, strife is going to grow in your life. If you focus on prosperity, God's prosperity, prosperity will grow in your life. If you focus on the love of God, the love of God will grow in your life. If you focus on the spirit of grace, grace, unmerited favor, benefits, promises will grow in your life. Guaranteed every single time. I'm going to start winding down this landless plane. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Who's blessed? Yes. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. Let me just say this. To come boldly means I have courage and confidence when I approach. See, if you don't know the grace and love of God, you're going to be under works, under law, under religion, under religiosity. You're going to be, when you make mistakes, you're going to have condemnation and guilt in your life. And you know what that does? You can't come boldly. You can't come with courage and confidence when those things are operating in your life. Because you always be, and you can't, you, can't come, you can't come boldly with confidence if you don't know what the Word of God says. Can I ask for finances? Can I ask for healing? Can I ask for this? Can I have a holiday? Come on, can I get a bit real here for a moment? Doesn't my, my Bible says, my Bible says, maybe Cole can correct me, my Bible says that God withholds no good things from His beloved. A holiday is a good thing. Time with your family is a good thing. Increase is a good thing. Health and healing is a good thing. Doesn't Psalm say this, that he, forget not my benefits? Oh, it's wrong to come to God expecting anything from Him. Well, you don't have to. I will. I'll take your portion as well. Gladly take your portion as well. Leave it. Leave it in the spirit realm. I'll have it. I'll have double portion. There's benefits attached to God. That's what grace talks about. Kairos, or Kairos, it talks about unmerited favor. It talks about benefits. It talks about mercy. It talks about his goodness and forgiveness. Amen? But he says, come to the throne room of grace and mercy in time of need. You know that when you come to Christ, mercy, you're coming to the mercy seat. You, you, you come to the, the throne room of grace and mercy. You're not coming to a, a, a place. You're coming to a person who is grace enthroned. You're not coming to a chair that's empty. You're not coming to a chair that depending who's sitting there on the day and who's rostered. That's not who you're coming to. You're coming to the person of grace, Jesus Christ himself, who has washed you, cleansed you, forgiven you, wiped away your past, and written your future. You're coming to a person enthroned. And so you're, it doesn't matter what you did. Mercy at the mercy seat wipes yesterday clean. And grace is released for now and tomorrow. I'm going to say that again. Mercy wipes yesterday a clean slate. But grace shows up for you right now in time of need and to get you through tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day until he comes. That's why he says, come boldly to my throne room of grace and mercy in time of need. It's not when things are going good. 
It's in the world we're in. It's a fallen world. We need grace and mercy in a fallen world. I need grace to do what I do in this church. I need grace for tomorrow, but I can't do it in my own ability. And when I feel insufficient, when I feel like a failure, when I feel like I'm not good enough, when I feel like I don't have the answers, guess what? He does. And I lean into His grace, His mercy, because they knew every day. He says, my mercy is on you every single day. That's the person I'm coming to every single time. This is an invite. Listen to me, church. This is important. When you come to the throne room of grace and mercy, it's not a religious act or religious place or theology. It's in a place of intimacy and prayer that you're entering into. In other words, when I come to the throne room of grace and mercy, I'm stepping into the person of Jesus in a place of intimacy and relationship and prayer, reaching out to Him and saying, I can't do it in my own strength, but I know you've paid the price already. I'm touching the hem of Jesus. You know, in praise and worship, can I ask the worship team, you may as well jump up if you don't mind. In praise and worship, there was such an anointing. Come on, it was an awesome morning. How many agree? The presence of God was here this morning. And I had this picture, I just had this picture of Jesus sitting on this very mercy seat and this throne running down, like running down and running down. It it seemed like rivers of living water flowing forever. But I knew it was his throne. And it was like he was inviting people just to touch his garment and get a touch from him this morning. That's what I believe he was saying. Amen. You see, we don't come in our perfection because we're not perfect. But we enter in through His perfection because He is the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Amen? It's about accessing His mercy seat. It's about accessing His benefits, His unmerited favor, and His promises. That's what that scripture says when He says, come boldly to my throne room of grace. He's not just saying, step into forgiveness. That's, putting, that's making Him this small. He says, come into my throne room of grace. He's saying, you know what? If you haven't accepted me, step in and accept me as your Lord and Savior. And I'm going to open up everything that the kingdom has for you in that moment. Boom. But he's saying to every believer, don't just come with a place of feeling like I I can't approach. He's saying, step into my unmerited favor. Step into the benefits of the kingdom. Step into my endless promises that I have for your life. Step into Jeremiah 29, 11 says that I know the expected ends for you. Plans are good and not evil. He's saying step into that place when you come into the throne room of grace and mercy in a time of need. That's what he's telling us this morning, church. Amen. You see, he says this in Psalm 84. Psalm 84. And the Lord started speaking to me last night and this morning about particular people. But Psalm 84, verse 11 to 12. He says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory, in other words, manifested goodness. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in You. We've been talking about what this all means. We've been talking about this grace that's been prophesied, this grace that's been released. This grace that comes through Jesus Christ by faith. This grace that grows, how? By hearing and hearing and reading and meditating and digesting it. That grows in our life. Those that trust in Him. Those that trust in His grace. That His grace is sufficient. Those are the ones that inherit that eat and taste, that enjoy the table. Because he said, I put a table before you in the presence of your enemies. It's not a table to stare at. You ever been to a buffet? How many of you just stare at the buffet? You want to go eat the buffet. He's put a buffet before us of promises, anointing, healing, deliverance and he says eat but you've got to come boldly 
You've got to come with confidence. You've got to come with courage. And you've got to come with trust. And you'll eat it. These things here, the Lord started putting on me. I want to pray for you this morning while the worship team... uh, Just, we'll see what... But the Lord said to me this, that people are struggling with guilt. People that are struggling with shame. People that are struggling with condemnation. People that are struggling with doubt. And people that are struggling with fear. All those things will stop you from entering in to the throne room of grace and mercy. I want to pray for you, if that's you. Can you ask you everyone just to stand for a moment? If that's you, any one of those, I want to just pray a prayer with you. I'm not going to lay hands. I just want you to raise hands where you are. Is that you? Any one of those, it's okay. We've all gone through areas of that. I first want to just pray one prayer quickly. If you say, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I don't know the Spirit of grace, I don't know if the Spirit of grace is in me, but I want Him. I want Him in my life. I want a Savior. Can I ask you just to raise your hand quickly? Just put your hands down. Sorry, guys. Is there anybody here that says, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Thank you. I see the hand. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Anybody else? Won't embarrass you. Can I ask you just to pray this prayer with me? If you're watching by live stream, Go onto our website. There's a a link there. And just send us a a notice. Let us know so we can get in in, in contact with you. But just pray this prayer. It's simple. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I didn't know any better. But today I do. I believe you died for me. You shed your blood for me. And you rose again for me. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. It's as simple as that. All of heaven rejoices just for one right now. Come on, give God praise. In I want to pray one prayer quickly for those people. Guilt, shame, condemnation, doubt, fear. Can you just raise your hands right now? Father, we just thank you right now. Father, you know where every single person's at. You, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. You wrote their stories. You knew them before they were created. You knew them before they were even in their mother's wombs. You know the journeys they've been on. You know their backgrounds. We don't need to know, but you know. Lord, I ask right now, by faith, and in partnership with you, Holy Spirit, that you would release, set free, deliver, and break free from any one of those things right now, and then never to return again. Father, I thank you right now. You said we're two or more stand in agreement, it shall be done. You said if we pray according to your will, it will be done. We know that you, Jesus, have set us free. Because you said who the Son sets free is free indeed. I pray for a peace, a freedom, a confidence, and a boldness for these people to be able to access your throne of grace, your throne of mercies, your throne of promises, and your unmerited favor. I ask for an acceleration, demonstration, and manifestation of your word because you said you back your word up. And I ask, Lord, that you would back your word up. Show up in their lives. Show them a sign that you've answered them this morning in Jesus' name. Come, if you believe you received that, give God praise in the house. Amen. Hey, I'm so glad that you enjoyed the message today. And uh, if you prayed the prayer, the sinner's prayer, the salvation prayer, I I just want to encourage you. Today, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. All things have become new. If you prayed that prayer, you're a child of God. You're an heir of God. And we want to help you. We want to help you on your journey. So can I ask you to go onto our website? The link is there right now. Uh, Just send us a message and somebody will get in contact with you just to give you a free gift to pray with you and to encourage you on your journey. God bless. We look forward to journeying with you. See you soon.